Thank you for being here. It's very exciting. There's a lot to say. Please ask questions or make comments as I go along. I promise that we will finish in 50 minutes. No more, because I want to hear Brian. Okay? Uh, but otherwise, I'm just going to speak very fast, because there's quite, quite a lot um, I would like to uh, share with you. So here is the, um, the new national curriculum in England for computing. Starting at primary school, this is age 6 through to 16. Every child should be able to understand and apply the fundamental principles of computer science, including logic algorithms, data representation, and communication, and you can and read and analyze problems in computational terms that have repeated practical experience of writing programs to solve them. This is black and white, the English national curriculum. So that's a kind of a big change that happened in September 2014. And we're not the only country that's doing this. So just a few weeks ago, where's Caitlin? Uh, so well done, Caitlin and Tim and your colleagues. Right? The, uh, New Zealand has announced that digital technologies will be fully integrated that means from primary school upwards, and digital technology means including uh, programming and unplugged activities and all that. Um, and so it's happening around the world. You will also know, this is another very timely announcement, the, um, uh, a big working group in the United States has been working on this framework for K-12 through computer science. It's, uh, the, th this curriculum, incidentally, is two sides of A4. That was the specification to cover 10 years of education. This one is an inch thick. I printed it. Uh, but it has, it has lots of really good content, to and it just came out like a few days Days ago. So, the, 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 oh, and, and there's a raft of other sort of slightly less timely reports, particularly around Europe here. And um, think they, they clearly, you know, something is in, the, is in the air at the moment. So, the sense I want you to give you is that, you know, the ice is melting, it has melted. Everything is in flux, and there's a lot of change in the air about education in computing. So, that leaves us as computer scientists with a challenge. You know, what should we teach, and how should we teach it? Um, and how can we support and encourage our teachers to do that? Because mostly they're under equipped, under qualified, and a bit at sea about what to do. And the risk, so this is, there's a sort of opportunity, right, that, that, that everything's in motion. The risk is that in 10 years' time, the concrete will have set. Something will be happening, right, and it may or may not be what we want. So this is our chance to influence what the concrete sets as. Okay, so I wanted to do um, several things in this talk. The first is just to step back a bit and say, well, what is it that we want? Right? So let me start there. So, and I, so I'm going to effectively tell you the story that we've been telling in the UK over the last few years, and to everybody's astonishment, with almost complete success. So I'll just share it with you, because it will be familiar with many of you, but nevertheless, it's a, it's a way to tell the story that has worked very well. So here's a quote that I really like, which comes from a United States Secretary of Education, Richard Riley. He said, education exists to prepare young people for jobs that don't exist, using technologies that have not been invented to solve problems of which we are not yet Aware. And I like it because it's so open, it's so aspirational, it's so not, let's just do, you know, have a lot of rote knowledge, right? It's, uh, and I, so I really like that, that sense. So how do we do that? Well, at school we teach children a lot about skills and a lot about disciplines. So by disciplines I mean things like maths or physics. Um, where there's a body of knowledge um, and theory that you might carry with you and that doesn't date very quickly. And by skills, I mean uh, stuff that involve typically artifacts and devices. So in school, this might be design technology, stuff where you're using band saws or sewing machines or uh, food technology, you know, co cooking stuff. So all this is quite important stuff, right? Um, both of these are important. They sort of leverage off each other, really. But we do, we, typically, we teach a kind of balance in schools. But what had happened, at least in Britain, um, uh, over the, uh, let's see, let's say the, na the, late, no, the later half of the 90s and the early 2000s, is that we, we sort of shifted this balance completely to the left. That, that we had actually a subject called information and communication technology. At least it was part of the national curriculum, but it was exclusively about technology. It was even in the very title of the subject, information and communication technology, right? Which is all to do with artifacts. Um, and so, you know, this was about spreadsheet, and basically it was about Microsoft Office, really, at its lowest common denominator. I work for Microsoft, I, you know, I think Microsoft Office is great, I'm trying to make it better, but <laughs> it's not what a computing education should be about, right? Um, so, um, we were fundamentally in this situation. So, what to do? Well, uh, the, 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 you know, the, the, the diagnosis is uh, too much focus on technology and not enough focus on ideas, right? But if we're going to say that, then we want to redress this balance, we have to say something about what the ideas are, right? So the, the discipline, if we're going to have a discipline here, is the one that we traditionally call computer science, um, which is a bit scary to teachers already. It sounds a bit like rocket science, you know, but so, so there's a bit of scare factor to deal with. But um, uh, 
we found it in, in this you know, telling the story in the UK, we found it important to try to articulate what computer science might be in a way that could be apprehensible to school teachers and to government ministers and um, you know, all the way up. And one of the most effective ways to do it is, comes direct from New Zealand, right? This is um, uh, Tim Bell and Mike Fellows' Computer Science Unplugged. So many of you will have seen this, but I'm going to show you this video because it's, it's I've shown, to, you know, shown everybody just from ministers of education downwards. It's a sorting network, right? The children stand on the thing, they walk along the lines, the six is bigger than the two, so they swap places, right? And uh, then, but it's a parallel algorithm. This is great, parallel algorithms for primary school children. So they do this all at once. Right, and uh, if they obey the rules and they, uh, you know, they, they um, follow the uh, the algorithm correctly, then when they come out at the end, uh, lo and behold, they're they're sorted, right? And this makes people smile. Um, and then you can do it as a competition. You can do it with bigger numbers. You can do it with uh, with larger numbers of children in the playground. Tim tells me that this 40-child version <laughs> took all morning to uh, film and only lasts 10 seconds on the video, or like five, maybe five seconds, but it took them the whole day to get the children organized enough to do this. So why do I show this? Well, number one, it's about primary school children, right? Number two, it clearly isn't about technology because there isn't any technology. Number three, there are interesting questions that even a primary school child could ask ask, right? So, like, is this always going to work? Maybe the numbers came out sorted, but the teacher put us very carefully in the right positions to begin with. So let's fool the teacher. Let's mess ourselves up at the beginning. Well, we still come out sorted. Would we always come out sorted? Would every input configuration come out sorted? How could I do this for more numbers? Could I do the same thing with fewer boxes and wires or with different boxes and wires? Some of these questions are quite hard to answer, but I love the way that even a primary school child could ask them. Oh, here's another one. Uh, the, you know, the six came out uh, above the three, even though at no point did the six and the three meet in the network. How is that? That's kind of, so these are, I, I like the way that you can ask cool, open inquiry type questions about it. So, and clearly not about technology. There's something cool. Here's one other example that also is uh, uh, kind of effective in conveying the idea that it's not just about technology. This is a finite state machine for generating sentences. So the rules of the game are, you don't tell them finite state machine, you say it's a game, right? Put your finger on the thing and you go, as you go along the arrow, you say the word. So a huge uh, clown sang and the big pirate and a uh, huge dog laughed. And that's the end of the sentence, right? So, and uh, you show this to, you know, to children, and as soon as they start generating sentences, then they start writing their own diagrams to generate sentences of their own, usually rude ones. Um, <laughs> then you, uh, you know, they start generate. They realise that they can generate infinitely long sentences. That's kind of cool um, idea. And then. Um, uh, and, and before long, you started to reverse engineer the laws of English grammar. So primary school children, primary school teachers like this because they're all about integration across the curriculum. So like they did, you could you know, in, in, uh, in, uh, inspire one subject with bits from another. Um, and then, of course, you say, well, actually, this very same idea shows up in you know, the state diagram of a microwave oven, which is equally impenetrable. To, uh, <laughs> so, right, so, but, but maybe you could start to draw it. So that's a, and then it would look similar to this. So there's some kind of common idea here that's being, being uh, exhi exhibited in very, very different circumstances. So these, these kind of ideas like this are good ways that we've found to convey a sense of what a computing curriculum that would go from an early stage might be about. They're trying to demythologize it from the very techie, sort of, uh, you know, spotty uh, male geeks who look at their shoes and sit in dark rooms looking at glowing screens. They were trying to get away from that. OK? So here's the, the, the vision then. Um, the, we'd like, I'm trying to present, in fact, we, you know, we tried to present in the UK computer science as a, as a foundational subject discipline that, like mathematics and natural science, every child should learn from primary school onwards. So this is a kind of mantra, right? And there's some careful positioning in here. Here they are. Number one, it's about ideas, not about technology. And I've been stressing that. And a, a good uh, Jeanette Wing's famous sort of computational thing, thinking meme is, uh, is very helpful in this. It's, it's a, I say it's a meme because computational thinking is something which means almost whatever you want it to mean that day, right? It's quite difficult to pin down. But it has the great advantage that it resonates with non-computer scientists, right? They think this might be something that we might want to, you know. So even Michael Gove, our Secretary of State for Education, thinks computational thinking might be something he wants you know, all children to be able to do. So it's quite a useful term. Just be careful not to sort of overuse it and to expand a bit what it means, because people often mean rather different things. Second thing, every child, not just 
um, the future of software engineers. If we're going to talk, speak about um, uh, foundational subject disciplines that every child should learn, then what proportion, what, do, we, do we teach natural science to, um, uh, to, uh, to every child because they're all going to become physicists? No. Not even because they're all going to become scientists or engineers. Some of them are going to become hairdressers, plumbers, lawyers, brain surgeons, right? So why do we teach them natural science? Every child. Keep them, off the hmm? Keep, them off the Keep them off the streets. Anything else? <laughs> Why do we teach every child natural science? Because we live in the world. Right? It helps them understand something. This is in every audience says it helps them understand the, the world that surrounds them, and that's something that kind of it's kind of deep in us that we believe that you should understand something about the world that surrounds you and have agency in it, be able to have some control over it, right? And if you and the digital world that surrounds us is almost in some ways more proximate to us than the natural world that surrounds us, and having some agency in the digital world, not feeling powerless in the face of computers that that are doing things to you, is really quite important. Um, but it's not just the digital world. I, I, I think one of the things that I think can be helpful is to stress that computation occurs in the natural world a lot. So if you look at the natural world through a computational lens, you can understand it in a different way too. So, um, uh, you know, think of cells as information processing agent or flocks of birds going around the sky. And of course, there is the instrumental argument about job skills. And so, but nevertheless, the job skills one, I, I think I would be cautious about, right? So this argument is really an instrument, an, an educational one, not an instrumental one. You'll see a lot of graphs like this that show, you know, there's lots of computing jobs and not enough computer science graduates. So we should teach computer science at primary school to fill our jobs pipeline, right? I don't think that that may do service to the three children who are going to become uh, software engineers, but it doesn't do service to the other 98. And moreover, there's a bit of an apples to oranges thing. So these charts can be useful, but, um, and they're helpful when you're speaking to, you know, governments, right, because they like this kind of stuff. But I, fundamentally, I think it's this educational story is more important. And the last thing... It's about a subject discipline, not about a skill. So if you look at a lot of the literature in Britain and around the world, you would think it's all about coding. And I adore programming. I do it every day. I just think it's the greatest thing. But I do think that there's something else to what we want to do over here that isn't just a sort of craft skill of being able to write programs in order to be able to get a good job. Okay? So that's the setup. Uh, where are we? 12 minutes in. We're doing well. Okay. Any, other, any quick observations or questions? Yes. Oh, does, that's right. So doesn't the word computer imply vocation? That's why it's called, in Britain, the computing curriculum, right? Uh, and why computational owl thinking doesn't mention computers. So Dijkstra made this famous observation, computer science is no more about computers than astronomy is about telescopes. And it's a slightly specious observation, but it has a great ring to it, and it, has the, it carries the right name. Yes? Oh, they, so in reality, uh, this is a real risk, right? That it will be all about technology all over again. That's why I said, when I put on my first slide, I said risk. The concrete may set in a way that it's just another technology subject again. That's something that people in this room need to work hard to prevent happening. Yeah. Oh, right. So, so uh, Papa was saying you, you might learn about computer science through programming. Is that? You, you, you code to learn in the sense that you're not, you, you use computing and computational thinking huh? to improve learning in general. Oh, to improve learning in general. Okay, so peace. Yes. <laughs> I mean, so, so the thing is, every subject likes to say, oh, and we will teach you thinking skills that will benefit all subjects at all day, right? But they all say that, right? Of course, it's true about computing. <laughs> um, but it's, it, it's, it's a harder argument to make as a primary. Okay? Okay, let's, let's proceed. So I want to tell you just a li li little section about what happened in the UK, because uh, it's just almost to encourage you. So he here was the story, 2008, uh, computing at school, this little working group uh, that I, I helped to start, started in uh, late 2007. It was four people um, at Microsoft Research in Cambridge. And um, then we were sort of gathered, it was very much a grassroots organization. We just gathered lots of teachers. And the, the first thing we did was we wrote a curriculum for computer science. So we thought if we're going to argue for computer science as a foundational subject that every child should learn from primary school, we ha should say what it is. So we wrote this uh, curriculum. Actually, it didn't start at primary school. This was secondary level. 
Um, it was about 35 pages long, and it, and it tried to, tried to, it was our first attempt to articulate what school-level computer science <laughs> might look like in a language that was intelligible to UK teachers. We were, of course, drew on tons of material from elsewhere in the world. Then we, we got lucky. Right round about uh, here, there was a change of government, and the new education minister, Michael Gove, launched a review of the entire national curriculum. Oh, another thing we were lucky about was we had a national curriculum, unlike certain countries where you have to persuade every school district. We had a national curriculum. So Michael Gove launched a review of the whole thing. So that meant that everything was in motion, right? So there was some chance that we could ha um, have an effect, right? Because uh, even the Department of Education knew that there was a problem with ICT, right? They really knew they had a problem. They weren't able to say so, and we were able to come along and say, actually, we know, we, we can tell you something about what to do about it. And there was a, um, uh, around this time also, there was a very influential report produced by the Royal Society. If you've not read this report, do take a look. Um, and it was um, the uh, CAS, you know, w was a kind of guerrilla group of upstarts. The government finds it difficult to listen to that. And it, and it was, uh, you know, three years old. The Royal Society is like 400 years old, and the government finds it a lot easier to listen to things that the Royal Society has, says. So the Royal Society's report was very, very helpful in making the case to say there is a serious problem, and, you know, in putting computer science as part of the school curriculum is a serious part of the solution. It was really helpful to work with, um, with the Royal Society on that. But they did, the fellows of the Royal Society who kicked this off did so because they knew about CAS and they wanted to do something to help. I think ab absent this, you know, guerrilla movement, this would not have happened. Um, okay, so then, uh, then in fact, um, the, the government asked the working group led by the British Computer Society to draft the new national curriculum, um, and there was a little working group set up. I ended up um, chairing it. When the spec was no more than two sides of one sheet of paper. That was our spec. It really makes you think hard. I tell you, it took a whole year to write two sides of A4, right? But here we go. So I'm, you could read it. I'd be very interested in what you think of it. I'm quite proud of it still, but of course it could be improved. Um, and then it actually launched into September 2014, too, so we're just entering the third year of the new national curriculum. Um, and I've showed you, it, but showed you what, it, um, what it was before. So that was, you know, a very accelerated version of what happened in the UK. Of course, you think you come to the top of a mountain, and there's just another mountain behind, which is what to do about it. So, uh, so I want to say a little bit about um, CAS as a, as a um, working group. So none of this really would have happened without CAS, I believe, or would have happened very differently. Um, and so I want to say a little bit about what, what CAS is, because it, it may, again, inform your efforts in other countries. So it's very much a grassroots movement, a sort of upward thing, not a downward institutionally driven thing. Um, it's a, a community of practice. So about three quarters of CAS's members are school teachers, and they are talking to each other all the time about uh, how to improve their teaching practice and indeed you know, what they're trying to do at all. And it's kind of independent. We're trying to speak for the subject, not for the teachers, not for the universities, not for companies. We're trying to speak just for the subject, and we're getting sort of enough credibility to do that. Um, Here's CAS's sort of um, membership graph. I should say you should take this with a pinch of salt. Joining CAS is free, right? But you do have to yield up your name, your location, your professional affiliation, and it's got to be your real name too. Um, so people don't do this li lightly these days. But nevertheless, 25,000 members is not bad. We're going at about 500 a month still. So it's, and, and, and some of them are abroad. This is a little picture of membership in the United States. It's thinly, thin abroad. I mean, it's dense in the United, United Kingdom, of course. Um, and it's very much not just teachers, right? So it's uh, IT professionals as well. Um, so we run uh, a couple of hundred hubs, which are physical location, physical groupings of teachers who physically come and meet each other once or twice a term. We train master teachers to d deliver training to uh, their colleagues locally. We have a lot of universities involved, and in particular, 10 of them run CAS regional centers, which are sort of coordinating their um, uh, uh, schools and training in their particular area. Uh, we have a really good um, uh, Termini magazine and a big um, online community. Yeah. Termly, every term. So, school, uh, so in in um, in Britain there were three terms: you know, uh, autumn, spring, and summer. And that, so, yeah. Um, so, it's, so we've turned. It, it, so it becomes a kind of instead of it's kind of the easy bit in some ways is influencing policymakers because you've only got to persuade half a dozen people, right? There are 17 and a half thousand primary schools and three and a half thousand secondary schools in England alone. That's a lot of teachers. So suddenly it becomes a problem of boots on the ground and scale. And so that's what CAS is busily trying to do. We produce quite a lot of materials. I brought some of them with me and failed to put them in this room, but I, will, I, brought, I brought a collection with me. Quite, some quite good materials, and we draw heavily on materials from elsewhere. You know, the um, Unplugged, for example, is super, super popular in Britain. So I just wanted to sort of finish this little bit just by summarizing what I thought, I was trying to reflect and think what worked for us and what didn't. 
Um, so here it is. Uh, Having one singular focus was very helpful, right? So the idea of that my little mantra of computer science as a foundational subject was very helpful to just say, we're trying to do one thing and do it well. Um, I've spoken about an educational message, not just an instrumental one. Having a single voice, that is, so there's a lot, there's a, the area is dense with stakeholders. And I spent a lot of time talking to other organizations and groupings and interest groups in the area to try to make sure that we were aligned, right? As soon as governments hear competing voices whispering in their ears, they don't know what to do, right? They think, you guys, you're going to get your act together. If they hear one voice, it's much easier for them to respond constructively. Um, I've said various other, oh, let me just say something about support from professional bodies. CAS, I've stressed sort of guerrilla movement, grassroots, lots of individuals, not much institutional heft. But in fact, after three years, I think we formed an alliance with the British Computer Society, which was our local version of the ACM, a sort of pro the professional body. And that was very helpful to us to have that alliance. BCS has been really good about allowing CAS an independent identity, but at the same time, um, uh, uh, making it part of BCS. You know, we didn't have a bank account. We couldn't employ anybody, right? We didn't have a legal existence. All of those things came for free when we were, became formally allied with BCS. Really, really helpful. And there was the credibility of people like the Royal Society saying what Kaz is saying is exactly right. That was very helpful. Support from industry, super helpful, right? I didn't mention Eric Schmidt. Oh, how sad it wasn't the uh, president of Microsoft, but never mind. Eric Schmidt, good on him. Do, did, you, did you hear about this speech? Yeah, yeah. So he came to Britain and he said, rather cheekily, I thought, I am flabbergasted, he said, that you don't even teach uh, computer science as a founder, you know, or programming as a, as a um, um, subject discipline in your schools. I thought it was a bit cheeky because it's not as if you do in every school in the United States. But, uh, but nevertheless, it was super helpful because suddenly, three weeks later, David Cameron, our prime minister, our then prime minister, was saying, I think Eric Schmidt is right. We should teach programming in our schools. He wasn't quite on message, but it was close. Okay. So... Uh, how are we doing? Um, we have, uh, yeah? Yeah, we have 18 minutes. That's good. That's good. Okay, so that was just the sort of UK context, just by way of background. Any, any other questions or observations on that? Yes? Uh, so when you have 25,000 members, how do you keep all of them focused? Oh, how do we keep, well, sorry, I wish it was 45, it's only 25,000. Um, yeah. But how do we keep all them focused? Well, so, so I guess uh, patchily, everything about CAS is patchy. Right? The, it's a volunteer movement. There are two full-time members of staff for those 25,000 members. There is no subscription. There are no income streams. So it's an incredibly sort of sellotape and string kind of organization. Um, so mostly, everybody sort of stays glued together through the mechanism of the, these um, hubs and master teachers and uh, the regional centers. And some people sort of go off a bit on one side. There isn't a uniform policy. I would say it's very, very hand-to-mouth, very ad hoc. Um, but that's also creative and diverse. You know, I'm, I'm a glass half full kind of person. I guess yep. probably having a vision pulls people together. That's right. Having, be, having a clearly articulated single focus, very helpful in pulling, because you join if you're interested in that. Yes. Um. Okay. So I was... Delighted to have the opportunity to come here, right? Because we need a lot of help, right? As I say, everything's very, you know, we're just about sort of limping along at this incredible scale. Um, so what do we need from, um, well, from, you know, academics and people who are professional computer scientists, con scientists? Well, we need help with this process of taking thousands of untrained, ill-equipped teachers who are sort of eager um, and giving them some evidence-driven reflection on pedagogy, that is how to teach, an assessment, I'm going to say a bit more about, more about assessment, for computing as a school subject. Um, so, in effect, in our country and, and in other countries around the world, I mean, New Zealand not, not, not least, but, and Australia also, and, and uh, the United States in many places, I mean, many, many countries are doing this. Israel has been doing this for, for uh, you know, a decade or two, um, at, at least in secondary, is we've got thousands of teachers who are actually supposed to be teaching computer science. So there's a kind of huge laboratory but in Britain, at least, um, we, we don't really have anybody studying what's happening, which is like, you'd think, we're doing this national scale experiment. Wouldn't it make sense to have a few people in lab coats with clipboards watching what's going on? No, nothing. Um, <laughs> teachers, I'm glad to say, are by and large eager but underqualified. That is, they're not sitting on their ICT you know, castle saying, uh, ICT is great. We just want to do that, please. 
Um, they actually approve of the direction of travel, by and large. They're anxious about the, ra the rapidity of motion, and they're anxious about their ability to deliver on it. But they, I think, by and large, they are pleased and indeed... Um, um, you know, supportive, not just educationally, but personally. ICT teachers were very low in the pecking order of, you know, teacher status. Uh, whereas physics and math teachers, super high in the pecking order. Now, you know, computing teachers have, you know, been jump-started into high-status teachers. They're like that. But, and, but because so little study, I mean, uh, uh, but comparative to, say, how much study has happened on university um, level education of computing. There's, you know, and, uh, and in other subjects, right? In, in mathematics, we have centuries of experience about how to teach maths at school, but we really do not have centuries for how to teach computing. So there must be low-hanging fruit here. So there's a lot to do. So here are the kind of questions that are floating around in, in my mind and becoming more sort of proximate. You know, what are the core concepts that we want every child to understand? We, we had a go in the national curriculum, but this is not a question that admits a single, fixed, easy answer, right? We're going to need to keep going around that loop a lot. Um, what do we know from from, you know, from uh, the educational literature in other subjects and indeed stuff that has happened um, elsewhere in the world, can we gather that together? And crucially, make that knowledge accessible to practicing school teachers, right? Not just something that, you, well, if you read some academic journal, you can discover something phrased in language that's difficult for um, you know, me as, a, let's say, a programming language person to under understand. So making it accessible is kind of super important. This is a, uh, you know, Splash is a kind of PL-ish kind of conference. So there's lots of programming questions, right? So, uh, like, what language do you use? Well, uh, and more importantly, for what purpose, right? Uh, and um, uh, I sort of kind of also want to wonder about how do we make sure when we're teaching programming, we're not just teaching some craft of learning a particular, you know, here's a failure mode for the entire exercise. Ten years' time, the Secretary of State for Education in England stands up and says, the new computing curriculum has been a success. Every child leaves school able to program in Java. Right? How do we stop that happening? Right? And so, the, you know, what is programming is clearly some kind of vehicle. It's a means to an end. I, uh, Brian may disagree about this in uh, about uh, uh, eight minutes' time, but but uh, but that he ha he will have his chance. Right? Um, <laughs> Let me just say also, it's not just about writing programs. It's also about explaining, debugging, uh, explaining somebody else's programs. So reasoning about programs. Yes. Um, well, uh, if that's all they could do, right? That, that, so, so I, it'd be better than now, right? But I think there would be a lost opportunity if they perceived that as their only goal, right? And also, it'd be hard to explain why you know hairdressers needed Java expertise. Yeah. Yeah. Uh huh. Yep. Yeah, uh -huh. So, what is the success? You have eight years to go. <laughs> so, so um, I would like, in every school in the land, computer science to be taught as and regarded as as essential to every child's education as people regard natural science today. Right? Everybody thinks we should teach natural science to primary school children. Oh, so, then I have a, uh, a concrete question. Uh, how do you measure that they understand something about physics? And how would you transfer this to so I'm going to come to assessment. Um, <coughs> I've got one, one little passage that I want to, to do before we finish. Yes, go on. Yeah. I was wondering if you were interested in being argued against about pseudo growth. Not yet. Okay. I'm just, this, is just a, this is just a sort of provocative uh, thing that I just wanted to float. So I don't want to get, I, I, because I only have, how long do I have? 12 minutes. Uh, 11 and a half minutes, yes. Um, and I have eight minutes worth of stuff to tell you. So, um, and then we have some more questions. So let, let's, let's table that for now. Is that right? Anybody else? Um, so I want to uh, say one other thing. Oh, that's right. Pedagogy and assessment. How should we teach and how should we assess it? This it goes a bit to Matthias's question. Like, uh, sort of, you know, what age should we teach? Which concepts? In which, in which order should we teach them? I don't think we know this stuff. We don't have anything like the depth of experience that mathematicians, say, have or, or physicists. And so, you know, and we're not going to come up with the right answer right away. But if... People like the people in this room don't engage with these questions, right, and engage with teachers. Something will happen, but it might not be the right thing. Um, so, uh, but I do want to stress engaging with teachers, right? I don't just want, you know, th this kind of research to fill the pages of academic journals. I want uh, to you know, engage with teachers as co-researchers, 
um, and quite a lot of this is happening um, in CAS at the moment. I don't really want to uh, say any more about this slide. But I just want to say one thing about programming to a programming that audience. Oh, sorry, did you, you can. All these slides will be readily available. Um, let's, uh, I think a non-focus is, if only we had a better programming environment for children, everything would be solved, right? Actually, we have quite a lot, and some of them are pretty good. Right, so I think that is the as a you know high order mission. Uh, I'm not saying it couldn't be improved, but I would encourage you to focus your efforts sort of elsewhere rather than on developing a new programming environment. Right, uh, teachers are a bit worn out with that. But I do want to spend just a few minutes on one particular thing that has been quite a revelation to me and and um, uh, maybe of some interest to you about the question of assessment. So I used to think of assessment as very boring, rather soul-destroying, and actually, you know, it can often be the tail wagging the dog. Um, but here is why I've discovered that actually it could be a really high point of leverage, because if we're trying to think, how can we help thousands of teachers, right, here's how we could do it. So here's one, one story. Every teacher must come to some opinion about whether their children are understanding what they are teaching them. And one way, not the only way, but one way in which they will do that is by asking them questions. Right? So they will set quizzes of some kind or another, um, probably. Where do they get them from? Well, they might buy them or download them in other subjects. There aren't very many such sources in computing at the moment. So they may well just make them up themselves. Um, but making up questions is quite difficult. Right? Assessment is hard. It's easy to test things that are superficial and not very important, like syntax. Right? It's harder to test things that are important and rather less superficial, like do you understand divide and conquer algorithms? Right? So um, writing good questions is hard. And the author is, remember, completely unqualified in computer science and barely knows what the subject is about. So this doesn't sound good, right? And, so, and, and even for people who do know the subject very well, it's easy to write bad questions, right? You kind of need field trials. So here's the, you know, the opportunity then is, is not to have this wheel repeatedly reinvented by thousands of teachers around the country, but rather to help them by sort of supplying or providing them in some way with a, you know, collections of well-crafted good questions. Um, and this is really important, not only for saving them work, because somehow whatever questions or, you know, quizzes, whatever a teacher chooses to use will, by definition, embody that which they are trying to teach. That is to say, if you choose to use a test, you try to teach in a way that will give your children good marks in that test, even if that's just feedback to them and you. This isn't high stakes, right? This is low stakes um, uh, formative assessment. So, somehow, uh, a set of, if you're trying to say, what does this two-page national curriculum mean? One way to incarnate it, to embody it, is to say, here are, you know, 10,000 questions. If you can, can do well on all of these, then you, you know, you've understood what's in here. It's a sort of explicit embodiment of a rather abstract document and a rather, uh, rather more operationalized explicit embodiment than tutorial texts. Do you see what I mean? So, uh, so this is you know, potentially important. So, um, so Quantum is the name of a project we're running in the UK. It's um, led by CAS with a couple of... Um, uh, sort of assessment-oriented uh, partners who are extremely helpful in this. So, uh, so here br in brief is the idea. We've got this online um, assessment platform. It's called Diagnostic Questions. It was, it's a small UK startup, so it pre-existed the Quantum Project. It's actually really good. Um, it uh, was already available uh, for free, and it will stay for free forever. It's, it's already crowdsourced, meaning that any teacher can write a question and upload it to Diagnostic Questions, get it, get it shared with other people. It's multiple choice only, right? So that's a limitation. But I was a bit sniffy about multiple choice questions. I thought, multiple choice isn't that a bit Mickey Mouse? But actually, it turns out that, if you talk to the assessment experts, they say, actually, you can do a lot with multiple choice questions, but they're not all that easy to write. Um, so there's a, there's a whole thing to unpack there. I don't want to get into, into that just yet. But let me just tell you the one really cool thing about uh, diagnostic questions, which is that um, when a student answers a question, they say, I think the answer is B, right? They get to write an explanation about why they think B is the right answer. And if actually A was the right answer, they immediately get shown explanations given by students who answered A. Don't you think that's a simple and rather insightful idea? So they get a student eye view given you know, a student's eye explanation for why the right answer is the right answer. Of course, might be completely bogus, um, 
but uh, you know, teachers can sort of filter them out, and the students get to rate these answers so the good ones float to the top. So that's really nice. And also, the teacher gets to see, when the student gets the wrong answer, they get to see what the student's explanation is, that is, what misconception they had, hence diagnostic questions, right? what misconception they had that led to their wrong answer. And that gives the teacher a lot more information than just got the wrong answer. Okay, so uh, online platform, formative, um, formative assessment. So this means this is not for the high stakes, assess the school, assess the student. This is like the quiz at the end of the week or the end of the day, mark shared only with the teacher. So this is purely a diagnostic tool to help t teachers and students understand what they've understood and what they have not understood. Super important because uh, um, assessment is often reused for many purposes and by being used for many different purposes it then gets bent out of shape. This has one purpose, formative assessment with low stakes, marks just shared, or you know, results just shared between the teacher and the student and nobody else. That's the idea. Um, crowdsourced, meaning, so this is it, this is, so this is a big bet that we're making, which is that usually uh, question banks are built by e paid experts who, who um, you know, are paid to develop questions that are then field trialed. So there aren't very many of them. They're relatively expensive. They have to be carefully curated and so forth. This is the opposite end. Let's let everybody write questions, right? Um, and then there's an element of professional dialogue. Questions have a sort of comment stream attached to them so that one teacher can feed back to another teacher about misunderstandings that their student had, say, or suggestions for how to improve it. Um, that's on a sort of per-question basis. And also, the system will show you aggregated data so you can see for any question anybody can see, you know, what proportion of students said A, what proportion said B, how many, que how many students answered this question at all. Um, it's free is very important to this project. It's, um, uh, the platform is free and will stay free forever, but uh, just as important, the corpus of questions, which after all we're asking teachers to write, right, are themselves available to free so they can be served up using other platforms, right? So the idea is you don't have to use DQ. The corpus of questions we see as being a, you know, a, a key outcome of this project. Um, and the other, pe the other valuable piece of data here is the data from thousands of questions, thousands of students answering thousands of questions itself will be available in suitably anonymized form to bona fide researchers. So that's kind of super important. Um, scope, uh, let's see, the whole computing curriculum from primary right, up, right the way up through secondary. Um, and uh, we have actually, uh, this is out of date. We have, to, we have a couple of thousand questions now, but it's not, not nearly enough. They got 20,000 for maths. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm envious. So let me just um, finish, uh, or um, really, really, really close to finishing. You're all right. Uh, the, 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 the sort of secret source in quantum, why, why won't we simply assemble a large body of crap questions? That is what crowdsourcing might well do. Mightn't it? Well, partly there's this sort of human feedback loop, which questions get chosen to be used in quizzes by teachers, and which questions have this dialogue. But also, we're hoping to use data. So we got a couple of people involved who are, whose business is not computing, but actually assessment. And they are interested in taking data from lots of students answering lots of questions and producing diagrams like this. Here's the, um, here's the idea. The, uh, uh, if you knew how strong, let's just say you could, you could measure the, the sort of strength of a student or the ability of a student along a simple linear scale. I know terribly unrealistic, but nevertheless, suppose you could. And then suppose you know for each student um, what they did. And then you could say, that's the horizontal scale. And this vertical scale is which question they answered. So here, the weaker students all answered A uh, to this question, and the stronger students all answered D, which is the right answer, right? So um, these diagrams are quite insightful in understanding a bit about the dynamics of the question. But how do you know how strong the students are? Well, if you have lots of questions and you don't know how hard they are, lots of students you don't know how strong they are, and lots of answers, maybe you could sort of solve a simultaneous statistical equation and come out with something. This is called rash modeling. And, you know, these assessment guys, that's what they do. They do it for breakfast and for lunch and for tea. You know, we don't have to reinvent that. We just have to talk to them. So our, our hope is that we will get, we'll be able to close a feedback cycle um, by using some of this data. So I just want to, uh, uh, this is an unashamed appeal to people in the room to, to sort of um, you know, think about whether you might use or join with quantum in some way, because there's a strong network effect here. If we could build a large corpus of questions that we all shared, that would be incredibly valuable for us as an educational community. We're just providing one possible vehicle for doing that. Right. So just using it and improving what's there or contributing new questions, really, you know, I've been talking to, to Kat, right? I've been begging Kat to the Australian, you know, Australian professional development thing. So we'll, we'll have more conversations later. But I do think, the thing I want to stress here is network effect. If we could find a way to work together at scale, we could, um, we, you know, we could all piggyback off each other's efforts and we get a flywheel going. That would be incredibly helpful. Um, if you want to find more about quantum, just Google. This, this pair of keywords actually works 
uh, at least for Google, I haven't tried Bing, which is a bit naughty of me. <laughs> but, OK, so just go for quantum and CAS, and you'll get, uh, get to quantum stuff. So enough about quantum. I just wanted to highlight for you that, that uh, this is uh, kind of crucial. Right, so last, last slide. Um, what, what do we need to do? We need um, uh, to, f uh, in this moment of flux, in which uh, there's everything to play for, we need the involvement not only of educationalists, but also of computer science researchers in figuring this stuff out. Um, and if we do nothing, something will happen anyway. Something will happen. It just might not be a good thing. Right? And so it's very important, I think, for us to kind of get stuck in. And it's no use expecting indiv individual teachers clearly can't do st stuff at scale. Governments uh, basically aren't going to. Um, often companies aren't, you know, they're not mandated to. It really is us. So uh, we need to pay attention and get on with it. I just wanted to, to finish by saying, uh, look, it's actually about our children. Um, I really want them to be, you know, empowered and engaged. And yes, employed as well. Uh, <laughs> So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave the picture of the, the children up, but the, I want you to remember this in your mind. Uh, but the, this is who it's really about. Okay, any, any other questions? Or <laughs>